So let's talk today about a fixed mindset. And you may wonder, what is a fixed mindset? When I was a little kid, uh, I had a lot of favorite cartoons. Um, and you're like, you can only have an favorite. Mm, not if you're me. Um, I loved Bugs Bunny and the Roadrunner like shows. Like, and they were all kind of the same. Like the Roadrunner was always trying to eat, get eaten, not trying to. Always getting chased by the mangy coyote who would fall and fall from the cliffs and whop hit the ground and like leave a dent. Um, there was Speedy Gonzalez, who I loved, Little Mouse, and Sylvester the Cat, always on a vacation in Mexico, would see him and try to eat him. Tweety and Sylvester, uh, those things. Tom and Jerry, oh my gosh, the amount that I love Tom and Jerry. And really, in the end, it was all the same thing. It was unrepentantly violent actions against cartoon characters. That's my childhood, and you're like, ah. That's why he's the way he is. But the fact of the matter is, like, we look at that and you think, okay, yeah, like, that was children's entertainment. It was to be sat in front of and you would watch it. You, It was one way. We were watching what Hanna-Barbera, Disney, or uh, Warner Brothers was putting out, right? That's, that's how we watched TV. When we had children, Josh Bell and Ethan, when we had our kids, I'll never forget, the first time the TV spoke to them and I was in the room. And um, I remember it being Dora the Explorer. And she's like, do you see Swiper? And I'm like, oh my gosh, do we have to answer her? Like, and I looked at Josh, she's like, she's behind you. And I'm like, what? She, what is happening? And it, now it's like Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. They're, they're super good. It's like, you know, do you see the clubhouse? And that was my Mickey voice. Um, but like you see that, and it's very interactive, and it catches the kids. I know Blue's Clues did this, and I don't know who the first person to uh, create this idea was, but um, I know it was tried in 1953. There was a guy who, um, to help people draw, they, they tried it, but it didn't really take off then. But as it's moved on through the years, children children's entertainment has become interactive. A fixed mindset would say, no, we have to give them more, more just dialogue and more things like that and more action, more color, whatever the kids want. Throw that at them. But what, somebody looked at it and said, what if we have them start throwing stuff back? Right? Like, what if... What if we did that? That's a growth mindset. That's a mindset that says, yes, this is what we've done, and it's not all bad. Actually, it's wonderful. But, um, but could it be better? And, and it looks to different horizons. It's not defined by what you can't do or maybe something you're not good at. Um, I know like when Peyton Manning got injured and had to have neck surgery, he couldn't throw a football when it was done. And he could have said, okay, my career as an NFL quarterback is over. The Colts let me go. And um, I have no place to really land. I can't throw a football. So the NFL seems a long shot. But he didn't accept that that was how it would be. And he went on to go to my beloved Broncos, and we just rocked it for a few years with the sheriff in town. Peyton got it back, right? He worked at it. He wasn't defined by what he couldn't do. He worked into what was possible, and he worked for it, and he ground for it. I love that mindset, and I want to do that today because a lot of times in church, we have a fixed mindset. You think, um, like, okay, I'm going to sit here. Eric's going to say things. We're going to be like, okay. And then you're going to walk away. But today I want to participate a little. Um, we're going to get our Dora on, but I'm not Dora. I like Diego. Anybody like Diego more than Dora? Not that Dora's not great. She's awesome, and I liked her little bob haircut and backpack. But, but I like Diego. He had a little bit of a fly haircut, and he was kind of cool. I like Diego. Go, Diego. Anyways, um, so I like Diego. So we're going to go with that. I'm going to be Diego today a couple of times, and I'm going to ask you something, or I'm going to say something, you're going to repeat a phrase back to me. And the phrase is really going to be the text that we use for today as a springboard out of a fixed mindset. There's areas in your life, there's areas in my life, where we have a fixed mindset. This is what is, period. And there's no way forward and there's no way back. It's just this static, fixed thing. And I would say that is a tomb. It's not life to the full. So today, um, out of 1 Kings, or 2 Kings 3, 18, there is, um, well, it's actually 318a, the first half of verse 18. 
It's just a really easy little phrase. And it's something spoken by the prophet Elijah, Elisha when he says this. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. So we're going to practice together. Um, if, if you're at See You Monday, I, I want you to say it loudly when it's your turn. If you're sitting at home, I want you to say it loudly. And if you're all just sitting there on the couch and maybe you're a little tired and drinking coffee, I want somebody to say it loud enough that it makes the other people around you awkward. Like really get into it and say it with me. So just we're going to practice on the count of three. One, two. Two, three. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. I want to get that moving through our heads because when I say the phrase, say it with me, um, that's what we're going to respond with. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. So this half of a verse is something we want to implant in our hearts. We want to kind of brand it into our hearts. And even the discomfort you feel in responding to this is actually, that discomfort is outside of normal. And when you get outside of normal and you do something and you lean into it, that's where you actually make memories. That's where you create and do something new. So I want you to do that with me and take part in it. It's a re wiring of your thought process. It's a rewiring of the idea of what's possible. And it starts with little things. So we're going to lean in on that today. I want to take you out of a fixed mindset as a church, as individuals. For me, myself, I'm, I'm comfortable just getting up here and teaching. But for me to ask you to respond, I know I do that week to week, but um, I want, I, I'm now counting on your response in this. And it's hard, but uh, we're going to say it out loud in front of people, and we're going to get used to it. And we may even be awkward and be like, eh, I did it, but that's fine. We'll get over it. Here we go. 2 Kings uh, chapter 3. I'm going to walk us through some scriptures today, and then I'm gonna, we're going to read through a pretty good chunk of it at the end. But first, or 2 Kings chapter 3 is a, is a section of scripture where Moab, not the one in Utah, out in the Middle East, Moab revolts against um, a tribute that they were paying to the kings of Israel from a former loss in battle. And when this happens, uh, there's this, this strange triumvirate that emerges of three different kings that come together to battle against Moab. It's the king of Edom, the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, and King Jehoshaphat, uh, which, what an un fortunate name. Wonder what he got called? Um, so, and King Jehoshaphat of Judah in Israel, right? These three kings, and they come together, and they go out to make war against Moab, who is who's actually revolting against them over a tribute they had to pay. It's kind of political intrigue. We don't need to worry about that. But what happens is really fascinating, because they lead their armies out, and they end up wandering a little bit in the desert for a few days and running out of water. So they've got these huge armies out in the desert, no water. And Jehoshaphat calls out, and he says, is there a prophet in the land of Israel, somebody we could call on for the Lord to, to help us in this? Um, what happens is somebody says, well, there's Elisha. He can. And so they call Elisha. And Elisha says, bring in a harpist. Bring in someone to play for me. So a harpist comes in and is playing for him. While he's playing, um, he receives the word of the Lord. And his response to them is, is fascinating. And it's one of those things that we've talked about already, but it's where he says, he says them, this is where we get our text out of uh, 2 Kings 3. He says to them, this is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. That's what he says to them. They are out of water with tens of thousands of men in a desert. And he's like, this is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. Here's what's gonna happen. There's going to be pools standing pools of water all over this valley. I'm paraphrasing. All over this valley. And, um, and you will have your fill to drink. And they think that's the problem God's solving, right? And it is a problem and God is solving it and it's easy in the eyes of the Lord. And so what happens is the rains don't come down. It says water flows into the valley. It's like it comes up from springs. And in the morning after they have drank their fill and are rested, there is water in huge gatherings of pools and ponds and crags in the rock covering that whole valley. So it looks like there's just water everywhere. And the kings of Moab, or the king of Moab, uh, the watchmen look out from their camp, and they look across the valley floor. And I, I wonder if the, if the sun did something in this, and, and God used it because it's so fascinating. They look out, and they see a valley filled with pools of water. But the water, I think kind of like the sun's angle, looks red. And they say this, oh my goodness, the kings came out to fight against us, and they fought one another, and they've killed each other. Look at the pools of blood. 
the pools of water filled with their own blood. So they rush out to fight what they think is a defeated army, and it's an army well-rested and well-watered, and they get routed. The, the, the three kings rout Moab, drive them back, and eventually subdue, and the king of Moab, like, he's totally subdued and destroyed. It's, it's an awesome story, and I think part of it is important that God only provided, not only provided the life-giving water, but he used the water in a way to, to trick their enemies that they would have never thought of. They would have never thought of it. They thought of it for their immediate need, but God saw that it could be used in a different way as well, and God comes through for them in a way that, um, that, that tells me this. If you're in a place where um, maybe spirit, like you're just struggling and there's no water and you feel like you're surrounded by enemies, right? It's a bit of a metaphor, but you're, you're like these, these people. You're in a dry and desolate place and you're surrounded by people who, who don't like you or who are your enemies. Why don't you say it with me? God's plan of deliverance for you, this is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. This situation is not as dire as you may think, because God is not only for you, but if you turn your heart to him, if you humble yourself and turn to him, I believe this, that God will answer, and it's his pleasure, and he's not put out by your need. He's the God who loves us, and the God who enters into the ordinary on behalf of us who are overwhelmed by our circumstances. So if you're in a dry place surrounded by your enemies, I want to remind you of this story and remind you that it is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord to intervene in your circumstance if only you would call on him and give time for him to respond. The second story I want to look at with you is out of 2 Kings chapter 4. Now remember, these are all out of devotions this week, and I hope you were in them because these will sound really familiar. But here's the story that comes out of 2 Kings chapter 4. There is a widow, and she was uh, married to one of the company of the prophets, okay? So remember we talked last week about the company of prophets that were with Elijah and Elisha, and then they crossed the river, and Elisha came back. Elijah was uh, um, taken up in a whirlwind. Um, he was one of those 50. He was one of the prophets that kept with uh, Elisha and Elijah, and now just Elisha. And he dies. And the widow, his wife, comes to him, and she, she cries out to him. And she says to him, like, my husband has died. One of the men you loved and served with and, um, and served you, and he has left us deeply in debt, and now our creditors are going to come and take my sons as payment and enslave them. And Elijah, or Elisha, tells her to go and get all, well, he says, what do you have? What, what's the thing that you have? And she says, I have a little jar of olive oil. I mean, you know it's rough when that's what you have. I have a small jar of olive oil. And he's like, okay, go and gather every empty jar you can. Go gather all you can. Ask people, bring in every empty jar you can. And then once you've gathered them, start pouring the oil into them. And you will pour those vessels full until you have filled all your vessels. And she does this. She goes and gets vessels, fills them, and the little jar of olive oil never runs out. It never runs dry, and it's pouring into all these big vessels around, and it fills them all. And she comes back and says, my Lord, the, the, the jars are all full. And he says, go and sell that oil, pay off your debts, and whatever remains you can live off of, you and your sons. It's an amazing story, but do you see what the only limitation was in it? What's the only limitation God put on that? I would say this. It's a limitation on her effort. How much she put into it is how much she got out of it. She could go collect as many vessels as she wanted. Do you wonder if maybe she, when he said that, thought, oh, I should have gone to a few more houses. I should have gone and, and take more. Yes, there would have been tremendous relief. But I wonder if she thought to herself, I missed an opportunity. See, here's the thing that I think matters in this. When, when the oil stopped, it was at the end of her collecting. 
And when those things happened, this woman who was about to lose her children and everything she had known, God intervened into her life. And from an earthly perspective of what, of what was going on, it feels like um, this is the most hopeless situation. And she is absolutely buried in an insurmountable thing. But God was going to intervene. But she would have to participate in a practical way and in faith. Her faith would have to drive her to act physically. And, and he told her, go get those vessels. I think it's important that we recognize the, the amount of faith it took for her to do this. She probably felt hopeless and confused. Why are you taking the one thing I have and having me pour it? She probably didn't understand all that was going on. But here's the thing, and it takes us back to that verse out of uh, 2 Kings 3, um, verse 18a. It takes us back to us. When you're facing an insurmountable debt, when your children are in danger, and I know this, I know our culture, I know where we're at. We, many of us are deeply in debt, we're struggling with things and our children are not safe. They've either run off from us or they're straying from the Lord or something's happening. I want you to be reminded, if you're facing these things, there is something we can, re, we can rewire it. The situation, the circumstance doesn't dictate what God can do. God speaks in to the circumstance, and the words we can be reminded of are the words I'm going to invite you to say with me right now. This that you're facing, this is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord, but how will you respond to what God tells you to do in faith and action? In James, it tells us faith without action is dead, and we cannot be people who do not act in faith when it comes to the life we live in Christ Jesus. Finally, we're going to look at 2 Kings chapter 5. And um, we're going to look at this, and this is the story of a Syrian captain named Naaman. And Naaman was a man of great renown. He was a man who was a great leader and general. He was powerful, influential, and um, he has leprosy. It's a death sentence. It was really a death sentence up to the turn of the last century, in, in the 19th century or the 20th century. Um, leprosy was dealt with and understood um, much more, you know, from a scientific angle. In the ancient world, previous to the last century, leprosy was a death sentence, and it was a horrible way to die. And Naaman got leprosy, and it would exile you from community in any place you were in. Actually, in Hawaii, you think, like, is this a Middle Eastern thing? In Hawaii, there's a number of different islands in Hawaii. There's, like, the big island. There's Oahu. There's Kauai. There's Lanai, the garden island. And there's a little island called Molokai. And Molokai, if you look it up, it has a history of being the leper colony for the Polynesian people. Isn't that fascinating? They would send them away because they were scared of it being a contagion. So you can see this has always been a serious thing. Naaman has leprosy, and Naaman is panic-stricken. He does not know what to do, so he loads up the, the like gift basket, right? Changes of clothes and gold and spices, incense, all that stuff, and he heads off to meet the prophet Elijah. I want to skip some of the fun details because he gets to, a, eventually Elisha's servant talks to him and he gets there and um, he tells him, tell your, tell your master, Naaman, to go and wash himself seven times in the Jordan River. To which Naaman replies, are there not many rivers in Syria in my homeland far better than this Jordan that are cleaner? I wouldn't do such a thing. And he's super ticked off and he leaves. But a little servant comes up to him and says, if he had told you to do the impossible, you would have tried. But this is a simple thing. Why won't you just listen to him? And Naaman's heart is softened to this. And so he goes and washes in the Jordan seven times. And behold, what happens? What happens to him? He comes out the seventh time, and it's the, the language Scripture uses. He comes out white as snow, completely healed of his leprosy. His faith in action according to the word of the Lord. So the Lord spoke through Elisha. He heard 
Then he obeyed and participated on God's terms, not his. And what happens? When he got over his pride and his self-sufficiency, he was completely healed. Our pride makes us want to do something about our problems. Our pride makes us want to find a fix. Can I just be super duper honest with you? This, I don't like Naaman because I feel like Naaman sometimes. Right? I feel like him. I want to take control. I want to get my hands on things. I want to, you know what? It's okay. I'll talk to him. Ugh. It's something I say, and I, I hate it now when I say it because I'm like, ah, it does no good. It's me manufacturing my own ideas. I want to do things my way. Right? I want to, I want to find my own fix, and my pride has to be dealt with. And I would guess this, so does yours. There are things God's going to ask us to do and our pride's going to be like, aren't there far better ways to feed the poor or to care for the needy or do different things or to heal what's broken in my marriage, in my kid's life, in anything? Isn't there something more I can do? And the question may be valid in your mind, but it's a question being asked to God's answer. God will tell us. He'll give us direction. The question is, will we manufacture out of our own pride a way to handle it ourselves and never receive what God has for us because we're doing things in our power and in our pride and our own self-sufficiency? So I'm going to ask you a question. It's a little bit, I think, jagged and hard to grab, like take in. But do you need to lay down your self-sufficiency and rely only on God, as strange as his call may be? Do you need to do that? This is hard for us, but we're learning something in our rewiring. Yes, this is hard for us, but this is easy in the eyes of the Lord. This is easy in the eyes of him who's called us according to his purposes. And if we believe that it's easy in the eyes of the Lord, his answer becomes the only option. It's just that our pride will rage against it. But it's easy in the eyes of the Lord. Finally, one last story, and I would like to read it together with you. It comes out of 2 Kings 13, 14 to 20. It says this. Now, Elisha had been suffering from an illness from which he died. So this illness is what eventually took his life. Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him, and he wept over him, this like tender moment. But get what he says. I love these words. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. What are the last words that Elijah heard as he was taken up from Elisha? My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. So there's this, this admission like this is it. This is it. There's a piece in the room that says um, he's, I, I think in a way, saying to him like he's sending him off. He's giving him you know, leave to go. And, um, and there's just, just a closeness in this. Um, the chariots and horsemen of Israel, he says. And then Elisha says, get a bow and some arrows. Like, <laughs> what? what a crazy thing to say. And he goes and gets him and he says, take the bow in your hands. So the king of Israel takes the bow in his hands. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Open the east window, he said. So he opened it. Shoot. You know, he puts an arrow out the window. And he and Elisha says when he shot, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over a ram, which is a, another ancient Israel uh, foe of Israel. He said, you will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. And he said, take the arrows. And the king took them. And Elisha um, told him, strike the ground. And he struck the ground three times. And they stopped. And the man of God on his deathbed was angry at him. And he said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated a ram and completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only three times. Elisha died and was buried. Once again, the only limits put on God's working are the limits put on by people. The king struck the ground three times. But if he would have kept going, if he would have persevered and done the awkward thing a little longer, even though he didn't understand why he was beating arrows on the ground, God understood. God knew what he wanted to do. And, God, and the king knew at this point that it was the arrow of victory over a ram. He knew the, the, he knew 
what was at stake in what was going on. He knew the power of it. And for him to just be like, whap, 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 you know, and hit it three times. Um, and Elijah was angry. There's this visceral, like, why didn't you act? Why didn't you go over and above? Why didn't you do all that you could? And I would say this, why do we, why do we do so little when God has called you to do something and you sit there and let him know all the ways it won't work, all the things maybe he hasn't thought of? Why do we do this? Why are you telling the God of the universe about the mountains he created, about the mountains he intends to walk you through, about the valleys that are darker than you hoped or feared? Why are we telling him this? He knows. He's God. Can we not participate in full-throated, full-involved bodies in his gospel mission? Do you believe in the limitless power of the one who sits on the throne, or do you believe in the circumstances and the surroundings you face? Do you refuse to participate because you see circumstances that you've been deceived to believe are bigger than the God you serve? We need to hear this. How has your pride or even lack of faith contributed to the fact that we have limited or put a box around what God can do? How have we constrained the gospel by our pride or even our lack of faith? We need to take responsibility in the fact that when Jesus was resurrected and 40 days with the disciples and then ascended, he left the job of the gospel to his church I believe that Jesus could have won the world in an instant, but for some reason, in the wisdom and and love of God, he said to us, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. He sent us, and we have been doing what the king has done in this second king's passage. We've been doing it most of our lives. God, you don't see the mountains. God, it's too much. God, what about God, God, God? And we just constantly throw it out like, we're, like he might not see it. And I think it's exhausting. So I'm going to ask you a question. What can you lay before him without pride, without self-sufficiency, without penance? Don't go back and be like, I'm going to do this to make things better and grovel. No, go back. And ask this, what can you lay before him? What can you lay before him without pride, self-sufficiency, and penance in order to earn something? Where in your life do you need to change a fixed mindset that controls your spiritual life out of fear, pride, anxiety, a desire of self-sufficiency, a need to grovel. I don't know. What can you do to break that fixed mindset and get this phrase grilled into your spirit, grilled into your emotions, grilled into your anxieties, grilled into your fears, get it branded into us. This is an easy thing in the eyes of God. This, what we face, is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. This, what we're facing now, requires us to have faith in him beyond the culture, beyond our circumstances. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. So who should we fix our eyes on? Because it's not going to be an easy thing for me. So if I dwell only in me, it's going to be a hard thing. But if I look to him, the author and perfecter of my faith, this is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. Lord. It doesn't mean the road will be easy. It means this. In God's mind, it's, it's, it's final. He can do it. There's not a question. The question is, how now do we respond? Courage, church. We are people of faith and people who believe the impossible because we have a God who in his limitless power, love, and mercy has called us according to his good purposes. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we love you. We trust you. And we ask that you would speak to us. We ask that you would rewire us. We ask that you would challenge, break, and grow us so that our lives would be, would be ones that declare the wonder and the glory of the gospel in areas where we have no pride, in areas where we're afraid, but your courage in us makes us brave, in areas where maybe we are broken and subdued by the enemy and your spirit gives us victory in areas maybe where we're dry and parched and starved and you nourish us. God, today we turn to you. And for some of us, it's just a whisper. 
because it's a frightening thought, but this is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. For some of us, it's a full-throated scream that this is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. But whatever mountains we face, we want to face them from your vantage point, God, from your view, not our own. Courage to your church, Lord, we pray. Strength for the challenges ahead and eyes that are firmly fixed on the one who declares that this is an easy thing. In your eyes, God, we trust what you see. In Jesus' name, amen.